Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bill Edwards, the symposium director for the Scott Joplin Festival this year online, but at least we are having something this year. Tonight, we're gonna to be engaged in a discussion which I hope goes far beyond what we discuss here next year. We may be able to do this in person and long overdue, but important. We're going to discuss aspects of race and ragtime and how they've evolved over the years uh, what, the, what it looked like back in 1900, 1910, what it looks like now, and anything we can do to be more sensitive to it, improve it, contextualize it in a dignified way. So I have many distinguished panelists with me today. I'd like to start with Carol. Hi, good to be here. My name is Carol Collins Miles. I am a fashion model, actress, recording, um, and composing uh, artists as well, and a writer. I founded the Scott Joplin Support Group here in Texarkana, and I'm also a committee member of the mu uh, Music Heritage Room uh, Committee of the Texarkana Museum System. And I, my whole thought is working with Scott Joplin, promoting Scott Joplin in my community and with the world. So I'm happy to be here to speak of some of the things we can do to upgrade our images and, and uh, further uh, gather people worldwide as, as fans of, of Joplin, Ragtime, and, and early music in America. Okay, and then many of you heard him earlier this evening, uh, Mr. Baron Ryan. What else can you tell us about you? Yes, thank you. I am a pianist in Whose Music Classic Meets Cool which spans from Beethoven classical to Joplin to Gershwin and, and now my own compositions as well, as you've hopefully heard tonight. And I came through, came to ragtime through my father, Donald Ryan, who many of you have heard at the festival as well. Yes. And I'm happy to be included on this panel. Okay, John. Hello, hi, my name is John Tennyson. I'm a physician by training, but I'm also a big fan of ragtime. Uh, I first became aware of ragtime having grown up in Texarkana, Arkansas and Texas. And uh, I was friends with a local musician and historian named Jerry Atkins, who some of you might recall, who was a Joplin scholar. Um, I'm probably more known for Boogie Woogie, but part of what I've done is a uh, looking at the history of Boogie Woogie and comparing and contrasting that to ragtime and kind of looking at their parallel paths and, and ways that they're similar and different from each other. So. Hopefully I can contribute something of interest today. And now we have another participant, Velvet, will tell us about her involvement. My involvement is through the Texarkana Museum System. I am their current board president. I've been involved with the museum system for about eight years now. And uh, we have a display on Joplin. Uh, we have what we believe was one of the pianos that he practiced on. And uh, as board president, I'm also, uh, I spend a lot of my time at the museums. I have probably been down at the museums at least once a week, if not three days a week for the past eight years. So I get to interact with a lot of visitors to Texarkana and have the opportunity to ask them uh, what they know about Joplin, what they know about other musicians that hail from Texarkana and to see how that uh, has progressed over the past eight years. And now Mr. McNally. Hi there, my name is Bill McNally and I've been a ragtime pianist since high school when a friend of mine who was playing ragtime introduced me to the style. And I wrote my dissertation on uh, the difference, the compositional differences between ragtime written in the 1900s and 1910s and the composers of the ragtime revival era of the 1960s and 1970s. And I'm really happy to be part of this panel. Okay, and I'm Bill Edwards. Many of you know me. I've been involved with the festival for a couple of decades and for more than a decade now, the symposia director. I write on this. I have a big passion for ragtime and like to present all aspects of it, be it uh, about women, which I've done an encyclopedia on, 
uh, about the race. I try and do something interesting every year. And I wanna get this started now. We're gonna go in uh, all barrels blazing and hoping that we get, uh, well, I know we will get very honest opinions from everybody. So our first question, 30 years after the Civil War ended, but more than a decade after Jim Crow laws were put in place in quite a bit of the Southeastern United States, race relations were often tenuous at best. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. Um, minstrel shows were at their height in the mid 1890s and a great many barriers stood between black people and success in most professional fields. Then ragtime, which has historically been considered a music of black origin, started to sweep the nation and in the world, arguably copied by white composers afterwards. Newspaper reports do discuss many black performers and composers well into the second decade of the 1900s. Do you feel that the, this uh, direct continuing involvement in the most popular music of that day in both fields helped to, uh, as performers and composers, helped to elevate the status of blacks in society? And what can you say about interactions that you may know of, of between the races through the late 1910s in the music world and maybe beyond? I'll start with any, Carol. What I'm about to say uh, needs further research, but um, with that, I believe that ragtime and the images of ragtime have been misunderstood and have not been put in the proper context. So a lot of people think that they're racist images, mm -hmm. even black people have thought that during, and during the years. I feel that ragtime came into being and blacks performing came into being at the after a bit after mid 18th century 1800s right after 1850s and right after civil war and that blacks were still suffering from slavery they were in shell shock culture shock and i feel that each encounter with a white person at that time was more stressful than it is today, much more stressful. And that perhaps the artists that were making uh, the artwork for the covers of Ragtime and other musics and for the publishers, which Blacks had no part, probably no part in hand in, in its conception and, and the work. I feel that the artist at that time looked at a black person, a black person looked at the artist and the artist saw someone who was completely shocked in fear, had hatred, hiding all of these feelings, mouth open, nearly ready to scream because in the, merely being in the presence of a white person could cost you your life. And I feel that the artists really, whether they want to be loving or not, they probably interpreted the black person with those image, eyes larger than what would the normal, not all black Africans have large <laughs> eyes and large lips, but a large majority that came to America did. But from working out in the sun, being from sun up to sundown and getting dark and darker, it made their eyes even larger. And with all of these emotions larger. And I believe the white artist who were hired to do these images for the music uh, really interpreted the blacks in exaggerated manners. And I think that it's something that needs further research. And I feel that we should really, when we see those images of the covers, we should put that in context. That's very interesting. Uh, yes, and, and Velvet, you there are some remedies that we can speak of a bit later. Okay, so Velvet, you spend a lot of your time in the world of Scott Joplin and you see music covers. Do you have anything to add? Um, no, I, when I heard Carol's response, I did think that it was a very interesting response and I do think that it's certainly worth some additional research. It also got my mind to thinking about um, 
thyroid disease, which can cause um, uh, some bulging of the eyes. And that might be worth investigating to see if there was a um, correlation between a high percentage of like Graves' disease or something like that that would create- physical cell anemia was also common. Right. Um, but as far as my personal thoughts, I just, I think it's a very interesting idea and something that's worth looking into. Um, I do think that our society as a whole and where we are progressing today, uh, there are a great number of things that sort of need footnotes um, and need to be brought into context as we discuss them. Right. Baron? More information never hurts. Okay, Baron then. I have uh, not much historically to add to what's already been said. My interest is in more performance and right and but as performers music do you feel um, elevate status do i feel would you repeat that question well if as performers do you feel it would elevate status let me give you some context in detroit fred stone formed a musicians union that by the early 1910s was so powerful that white musicians were lobbying to get into it because they weren't getting any gigs uh, and almost the same thing was true of the Clef Club in New York. So that I think elevated some status and uh, particularly people like James Reese Europe who had the best society orchestra around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, my my thought with when, when you posed the question is that I would uh, rag time when you, you stated, it was part of the question that um, black musicians created ragtime, which to an extent is true, but without white musicians, there wouldn't be the musical input for ragtime to exist. So we shouldn't, um, I think that's a, it's, it can be, um, it can behoove us to remember all, regardless of, of the status of the different musicians who are creating the music, that there was important input from, um, from everyone involved, and and it's not necessarily just because there were some people who uh, perpetrated oppression. Um, it's not. It, it behooves us to remember that they were individuals who did so, and not um, categories of of races within humanity. So that um, and to my, my concern is more. Okay, what do we do about it today? Um, we'll get so, there. We'll yeah. Get there. John, anything to add? Yes, well, I think about some of the people that I've interviewed in Texarkana who either recalled their own personal experiences or that that their parents shared with them. One man was Wilbur Smith. Wilbur Smith is a well-known Texarkana historian who's now deceased, but he he would go around in the nineteen in the nineteen tens and collect the coins from the player pianos, many of the brothels, which were black brothels, and he was appreciative of the piano music. Uh, being played both live and by on, by player pianos. And his father also observed music being played by black musicians uh, in the 1890s in Texarkana. So even though these were not, these these venues did not have the prestige that some of the unionized institutions would have, it certainly, uh, I think, caused the black music to be more greatly appreciated by white individuals living in Texarkana than, uh, than otherwise might have been the case. Um, the other thing that came to mind when, when Carol mentioned the sheet music covers, it's a, a very interesting theory. I, I'm really curious to, to think more about that. And it sounds like, if I understood you correctly, Carol, that you were describing white artists who were unwittingly portraying uh, black caricatures uh, in which the, the white artists were unwittingly portraying these caricatures as uh, with terrified features, wide eyes, open mouth, even if they weren't intending to portray a black person yes. is in a terrified state. They I feel were this is a natural image that they have of black people from interactions or from yep. seeing other visions because most interaction between blacks and white would uh, give you, uh, the blacks would express this wide-eyed fear and need to escape. And this is yes, uh, true in, in silent cinema as well. You would uh, usually, when the blacks were cast is because they were running away from the ghosts in the house or something like that. Right. Yeah. So that'd be an example of them intending to portray terror. And actually, I thought of the sheet music cover Hoogie Boogie Dance, 
Yeah. I know, Bill, I know you've written about that. And I, that's very important in the world of Boogie Woogie because it's phonetically, it's starting to approach the term Boogie Woogie. It's not quite there. But this is a sheet music cover that maybe you want to show it. It's it's a terrifying cover. It shows a black man on his knees. He's hands together as if he's praying. His eyes are wide open. His mouth's wide open. And he's surrounded by terrifying figures. There are two hooded, hooded figures that look like KKK members. There's a policeman between them. And then there's all these maybe three or four other fantastic looking things that might be human or might not. But he's clearly in a state of terror. And of course, you know, boogie, a boogie man, that, that, that lends itself to that prior etymology. But in this case, they've actually doubled it phonetically, hoogie boogie dance, which, which occurred in print before boogie woogie did later on. Actually, the quotidian for blacks at that time, a state of torture, fear. This is right after slavery and doing slavery from 1830s and 1850s and, and 70s is when ragtime started to perhaps emerge. And you're absolutely right. Ragtime uh, is from uh, European folklore, from folk, uh, from, from a blend of all races that came together with the sound of, of our railroad industry. And, and so it's not just Blacks who created ragtime, right. but it was Blacks who put it, namely Scott Joplin, who put it on the world market. Uh, Mr. McNally, I know this is not your area so much, but do you have anything? Well, I, I have several thoughts on this, and I want to try to separate a few points out here. I, I want to approach the sheet music cover issue sort of separately. And regardless of the origins of how uncomfortably and unpleasantly caricaturized uh, Black people were on these covers, um, this is marketing sensationalism. It was not unique to black people. It, it's how marketing works. You know, take any little difference and exaggerate it like crazy, and it draws attention. And you know, one one might approach the subject as there's no such thing as bad attention, um, e even though in this case it's absolutely you know bad attention. But it, it apparently sold stuff. Uh, what I want to come back to, though, is Barron's thought about uh, this ragtime style had white music input. So if if we go way back, and this is like pre-Civil War, and we can even go pre-United States, you know, we, we have this long history of uh, choral hymns and Protestant hymns. And then the first formal music styles that came to the United States, uh, other than church hymns and, and real basic folk music, uh, would have been German music, uh, heavy on the waltzes and heavy on the polkas. And so, yeah, we, we have a, a structurally white musical style that's pre-existing. It's one of the key ingredients that became ragtime. Um, without African clap and call, yes. Sure, and those would have been musical styles that would be performed at non-religious community events. So black people would hear it, white people would hear it, everybody would hear it. Uh, so black people would not have missed the sound of German marches and German polkas. White people, on the other hand, would have missed any syncopated elements that were starting to emerge in Black styles and Black music. And uh, white people, to a very large degree, turned a very blind eye towards the very unique styles of African spiritual singing from the 1700s, 1800s, early 1900s. Mm -hmm. So as we bring all this together, it allowed ragtime to develop in the ragtime community to a pretty sophisticated level before it became noticed sufficiently by a white community. And then the white community that noticed it was the young white community that wanted to do what their parents didn't want them to do. So if, if we swing back to the, the question of why, uh, or, or if uh, ragtime elevated black musicians yes it did but it had a chance to grow from within before it became the ubiquitous form that 
all musicians in America ultimately had to kind of contend with it. I mean, by, by 1910, um, imprecise date there, but you know, by around 1910 or so, uh, if you were a musician, you took a stance on ragtime because that's what was popular. And most popular so, music we know today sprang directly from it. And it sprang to uh, being popular by, I feel, to a great extent, by Scott Joplin's Maple Leaf Rag being on every piano in every salon. And I hear this like velvet from elderly people. You know, we, my mother taught me this. You know, we all knew this. Everyone loved the music because it had the roots of every race within that. So um, I have a side question then based on that. How many people do you think knew at that time? And there are still people who are surprised to find out that Scott Joplin was black. Well, I believe everyone, <laughs> including the black people who almost ran him out of town in Texas County for playing for a white group. Um, I feel for the curvers, I, I, I feel that black people really are not accepting those images because they want to move away from them and they don't understand why they're like that. Even though we know that blacks could not work in, on the market as, as artists. But I, I think that um, I, I would like to say before that I think we should we must black and white all respect the work of the, the talent of the artist within the uh, beyond the cover of the work, the, the song, the book, the literature, whatever was inside. And because they had no, probably no say in, assigned to the cover. But also we must accept the artwork that was done by the cover artist. A lot of times from their point of view, but a lot of times done with full heart to the best thinking that they were doing, putting beauty in what they were doing. So we must put all of this into context when we're looking at that and, and accept the work of what it is and now try and see if we can advance better meaning of it and, and get participation worldwide. And I'll get to that later, what we can, some competitions okay. and such. Carol, I, I just have to say that you're, you're seated in front of some really lovely paintings and they're, it, it's artwork for the sake of art. And if we're looking at ragtime sheet music covers, that's artwork for the sake of sales. I can't say that any artist of ragtime sheet music cover was oblivious to that. Um, Absolutely. But there was nothing they could do about it. And you're right. You know, the exaggerated movements and all of that is right. What black, where black people are offended is in oversized lips, oversized eyes, and those grotesque expressions, and which probably weren't done for white people. You know, they probably were um, uh, displayed in, in larger ways, and everyone was for the sake of, of promotion, but it wasn't those features that we, that blacks found hurtful then and hurtful now. This is why whites gravitated to one of the reasons to ragtime when blacks really never did. And we have to get those black people in to appreciate that the music is as much as the whites who have forgotten it. Okay, well that segues into our next major question. Uh, a, a good, a very good ragtime player and composer that we all know uh, he told me his views on this some years ago about why it's hard to get Black people interested in it. It's because starting even in the mid-1910s, they were always trying to advance, to not dig out of a hole, but to, to elevate what they were doing. And from that came jazz, jazz and blues, swing, the rhythm and blues, uh, and finally rock and roll and other such things because they were always advancing. And then he also pointed out even rap is from that. And if you look at, at some uh, ragtime, especially if you hear the lyrics of the Maple Leaf Rag, it's rap. And rap is nothing more than asymmetric poetry to music. Uh, and it's very finely done. So do you feel that this is a correct characterization? And I'm less uh, qualified to speak on this, but I'd sure like to hear from Baron. Were they trying to move forward and leave the past behind? That seems reasonable to me. I have, uh, I, 
from the performer performance perspective, not the historian, it seems like um, to to study and become passionate about learning the music that used to be popular is a luxury that only affluent people can do. And blacks in this country have historically not been affluent. We've been trying to become affluent, and so I think, okay, well, what can we do that will then capture ha capture the the masses' attention uh, rather than the attention of our of our parents thirty years ago, or sh shall we say? And so, yeah, there's been obviously it's not like black people haven't haven't been musically productive, um, but it certainly makes a lot of sense to me that that we have been uh, looking toward what will be popular tomorrow rather than what was popular yesterday. John. That's a great question about, yeah, as far as the, the relationship of uh, black Americans to ragtime music and did they, did they want to move beyond it? Um, my, when, when uh, Bill McNally mentioned a moment ago about the syncopated melodies combined with the, uh, the German umpa or polka bass, um, I've, I've been of the opinion for a long time that that the uh, or even Scott Joplin himself, I think it was after 1900, he he seemed to identify the word ragtime in his own definition with the syncopated melody and not necessarily the umpa bass. So in some ways, it, by 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 locking that syncopated melody into a predominantly umpa bass, in some ways, Joplin made that music less he gave it less of an African musical sensibility or an African American sensibility and might have actually made it less aesthetically interesting to black Americans than if he had actually had a rhythmically less bland bass. So in some ways, when I, when I look at um, some black expressions of music in the United States, um, I think of the more recent uh, album by Marcus uh, Roberts, uh, the yes. joy of Joplin, Joplin yes. in which he takes, he takes Joplin and, he makes Joplin uh, interesting in the bass figure as well as in the treble figure and just goes off on in a totally new direction. And, and I think that in some ways is aesthetically speaking, may, appeals maybe more to a black music traditional sensibility than, than even the original Joplin compositions that do. Um, so, so I think that, that the Joplin seemed to want to appeal to, he wanted, he wanted to, to have the, the, the European tradition in his music, but in doing so, he might have lost some of the black audience and gained some white audience as a, as a process. Um, but that's that's really all the thought I had about that. Okay, Velvet, I know that you're probably a little more of a lay person, but you do understand the music, obviously. Um, oh, I'm very much a lay person. Um, I have absolutely no rhythm. I do have a love of music, um, but um, I think a lot of what may have occurred is due to the fact that as people, we generally have a very short attention span. And uh, I think a lot of this is just um, movement from one genre to another. It's just we get bored with things and we experiment and see how we can tweak things and move forward. Um, so I don't know that it was so much an escape from, uh, you know, trying to stay ahead of what uh, white America may have um, captured from us and go out and garner something new, but just uh, it, the musicians that I know are all extremely talented, always thinking, um, you know, three or four beats ahead. And I, I think that it's just natural progression. And I know, Carol, you got something to say. Yeah, I agree with Bell that I believe it's more a natural progression, you know, from ragtime to jazz to rock and roll. This is, you know, Blacks are right there. But I think the reason ragtime was not embraced more by the Black communities because of these caricatures of the image of Black people. And on stage, there were caricatures as well, not just minstrel yes. shows, yes. but uh, Jolson and Cantor. Absolutely. That who were doing the minstrels. Minstrels were, you know, European in America much yeah. long before uh, I, Blackface started. But when Blackface started, it, it did uh, capitalize on the Black music that was normally played on plantations and could not be played anywhere else by Black people. And then they began to use Blackface until the minstrels, Blacks, began to, to enter the uh, have troops as well in the 1870s, such as that. 
But mm -hmm. I do believe that, you know, music's pro progressing by blacks and whites at an even pace. I don't, I don't think anyone is running away from anything other than those art images that people did not like. Even though black people at that era were more concerned with gospel music and masses being in the pub on public display, they did. Uh, ragtime of Scott Joplin is not just one type of music. It, it blends all of the music together that everyone would love. But those images are really something that needs to be taken care of. Well, that's a balanced answer. I like it, uh, Bill. I, I wanted to come, Carol, to what you had just mentioned about the the forward movement of both Black musical styles and white musical styles across the 20th and into the 21st century. And without question, uh, most musical styles that were the most popular musical styles across the 20th century have been um, really Black-created musical styles as we move from ragtime into stride into jazz into bebop into various more progressive forms of jazz and as we go off in one other direction to rock and roll and as we evolve into jazz uh, to rap and r and b and so on there are also lots of white musical innovations the fundamental difference i find between them is that more of the white musical innovations tend to be based around changes in approach to harmony. And more of the black musical innovations tend to be around different ways of approaching time and rhythmic elements in music. And I think we actually are coming to a pretty fundamental layer here. I mean, if, if you look up the most basic definition of what music is, it is sound in time. Uh, does it need a melody? No, we don't. We don't require a melody. I mean, tell any drummer that he's not a musician. You know, you're going to have a very disappointed drummer on your hands, right? So, so if if time is the first most fundamental element and ingredient of music, uh, the black priority towards musical innovation has been on the winning team. <laughs> it's been on the time team. Uh, you know, and, and what I found as I studied a lot of the more progressive compositions of the ragtime, uh, the, the resurgence in the 1960s and 70s, uh, you know, looking at more classical composers like William Bolcom and William Albright and where ragtime was kind of picked up and appropriated in different ways by the classical music community. What ended up happening in most cases was that the harmonic language of ragtime became richer and it became richer at the expense of interesting syncopation. If you made the syncopation busier and the harmony busier, what you had was cluttered music. And so that just didn't work. Stravinsky tried that all the way back in the late 19 teens. <laughs> but if you look at uh, how harmony has evolved in in classical music. Um, it's a way of trying to devalue the rhythmic elements of music. And it's fascinating and it creates a very interesting musical language. I, I love a lot of that music, but it's less accessible. And there, there are really obvious reasons to me why more black musical styles found their way to the the top of the popularity mountain uh the, it, it's just it's about the heartbeat <laughs> yeah well whatever the beat what the, yes it was important you know and and i mean we we can really go back to and I, i'm gonna say tribal but i don't even mean you know african-american tribal or even african tribal i just mean tribal um music tended to be more communal it tended to be a more interactive business and uh for a very long time courtesy of uh you know the the medieval church music happened up there to be heard by the people down there and so there were the performers and there was the the listening audience effectively Actors and if there's that that wall between the performer and the audience, um, 
the performers can really hone and refine their craft in a way that allows them to develop whatever elements they want to. But if it's communal, if everyone's involved, the beat remains way more important. Well, you did talk about the revival. That's where I want to get the first major revival in the 70s. In the 1950s, uh, ragtime was repopularized in the guise of honky talk with uh, old mistuned pianos and and poor drumming and it evolved into something better in the 1960s but even by the 1970s when Joshua Rifkin and and Max Marath and many others were trying to push the more classical aspect of it uh, there is just looking back at recordings and concertizing a clear lack of participation by people of the black community and I'm trying to figure out if this was by design, they didn't want to associate with it, or just a lack of interest. Uh, let, why don't I start with Carol? Well, I must go back to what I was saying. It got a bad image in the late 1800s and, and, and the beginning of the 1900s. And I don't think it has ever um, recovered from that image of, of a music that was, uh, ostracizing black people, the image of black people and black people who wanted to grow beyond the image of slavery and the image of fear. And so I think that those images followed the music more so than the music are the images. Okay, uh, Velvet. What I can tell you um, from the people that have visited the museum, um, I don't know that uh, many of them realized Joplin's connection to Texarkana, not even our own Texarkana natives. Um, I don't know if they truly know that Scott Joplin was African-American. The one overwhelming thing that we hear when we mention Joplin and ragtime is the sting. 95% of what we hear relates to Oh yeah, that's the music from The Sting. And we love uh, it and hate it and often say, oh, Sting, where is thy death? But wonderful. It, <laughs> it, it was popular and it did actually help our cause. It did its job, right? Yeah, it did. Yeah. Revived uh, our right time. So, um, you know, I don't know a true answer uh, other than uh, in the 1970s, that movie helped boost uh, a love of ragtime and it may be that that movie uh, was more popular among uh, Caucasians than it was among African Americans. Um, I did want to touch on the last question that you had a little bit yes. about uh, African American music sort of progressing more than um, Caucasian music. Yeah. Um, one thing that I have sort of pondered is African Americans typically came from a much lower socioeconomic background. And when you add money to a mix and an expectation of making money at this level, and an expectation of making money at this level, I think your creativity creativity vastly goes it sort of goes down the higher the income expectation goes up. The more you need to make to sustain yourself, the more susceptible you are to sort of selling out. And uh, yes, so I think that one of the things that may have helped African music, African American music be so progressive is the fact that African Americans did not need to make as much to get by. They were doing music a lot of times for love of the craft and not love of the dollar. Well, that's an excellent point. Uh, back to the 70s. Uh, this is when your dad, Baron, got involved with this. Uh, what can you say about it? I actually I yield my time to Bill because this is his wheelhouse, and if I had oh, okay. things to add after he talks, then I will, and and John too. But I would really I like agree. to hear what he has to say. Okay, John first, then. 
Well, I, I found myself resonating with what Bill was saying about the emphasis on rhythm and how that makes the music more interesting, um, not just to African-Americans, but probably to people in general. So if I had to hypothesize, I would say that the, the traditional way that white musicians were striving to play Joplin in the 1970s was probably less interesting to black audiences as compared to if they had tried to play it like Marcus Roberts, for example. Um, I think if they had tried to, you know, create new derivative improvisations with a good beat that made people um, that didn't have that kind of the incessant um pa um pa underlying figure, which can get fatiguing after you listen to a whole album or a whole concert of just Joplin, I think that that would have broader appeal. But that's I, I'm I'm a, I'm biased because I'm I'm one of those persons I hear rhythm before harmony. Any harmonies I get are just by sheer luck. Rhythms that I do are much more <laughs> intentional. So I, I resonate with rhythm as well. All, all right. I, I'm i almost afraid to try to tackle this one. I, I want to start by approaching the sting uh, as somebody who was born at least a little bit after the sting and, you know, question whether the influence of the sting is really present to to most of, of our society today. Maybe I not today, but I will tell you as a survivor of that time, I saw it when it came out on Christmas Day, 1973, and Ragtime did explode. Oh, uh, the Entertainer became a number uh, top one hit on the radio. It was fantastic. So it did. Have so a look, if, if we're going to credit it with, with the Ragtime, well, at least being a major component of the Ragtime revival, yes, of course it was. Absolutely. Um, whether that's how most people today become familiar with ragtime, I think that becomes much and much less true as, as the years go by. Um, you know, I, I know that most of my students have encountered ragtime predominantly through things like video games. Uh, that's that's the, the entry point for a lot of people to ragtime now. The ice cream uh, truck. Sure, the ice cream truck. I mean... I'm going to go all the way back to uh, what, what one of you had said earlier that, uh, you know, some a lot of people don't even realize that Scott Joplin was black. Well, frankly, I don't know how many years went by before I realized that Joseph Lamb was white, you know, and I, I found it very interesting that this this New Jersey kid, you know, just heard ragtime, really liked it. The music came first. The race didn't matter to him. He wrote ragtime. He loved ragtime. So he wrote ragtime. Um, I, I want to try to, well, okay. First I, I want to approach composers, classical composers writing ragtime in the revival era. Um, they were writing it first for their own entertainment. They didn't take their own composition seriously. They wrote it to amuse each other. Um, William Bolcom would write a piece of ragtime and send it off to William Rest Albright. Knuckles. William Albright would write another piece and send it back. And they quoted each other constantly and they just had fun with it. Joshua Rifkin happened to be a friend of William Bolcom in New York City in 1970. And when he came up with the idea that he was going to record a whole bunch of Joplin, he came up with that idea because he thought, well, here's something different. I'll give it a shot and see if it floats. And, and that's exactly what he did. I mean, he, he assembled a, a Scott Joplin recording on the hypothesis that it was a different way of approaching something that was fairly familiar, if not household familiar music. So anyhow, that this, this brings us through the revival a little bit, but I, I want to approach the issue of education that we tend to teach most subjects by bringing out a hero of that subject and going through what followed their their rise to stardom of whatever whatever sort that was and if there's a happy ending great if there's a sad ending like the case of scott joplin you know all all the the sadder uh, but it, it makes for a good story it doesn't necessarily tell the story well, but it's an effective way to introduce people to the story. The problem educationally that I'm starting to see is that for the most part, the education stops at the end of the hero story. And the ragtime era 
might not be taught. Scott Joplin will be taught, but the ragtime era might not be taught. So we don't really get a, a clear picture. Um, you know, George Washington as someone who rose to become the first president is, is taught in a, a linear fashion, but that doesn't mean that we really get the full picture of what his living environment was and, and what his home life was and what his plantation was like and so on. Um, you know, the, the New York Times tries to turn this somewhat on its head in the 1619 project to some degree by knocking down some of the heroes that we've been teaching, but that still doesn't quite get us to the place of teaching the era, teaching the, the cultural structure. And I think we, we need to maybe start approaching teaching a cultural structure differently so that people understand the setting in which you know these these very racist looking sheet music covers came into existence in which ragtime despite those sheet music covers absolutely flourished for a long time okay well i need to move forward to our our last topic so we can uh wrap this up eventually uh We've hit, we're in a digital age, a magic digital age now, and there's arguably more ragtime unleashed into the world than there ever has been through YouTube, Facebook. Uh, I've seen short snippets on TikTok. It's just everywhere. It's and it's it's great. Uh, one of the great things we have is plenty of kids and twenty year olds, and I know you were one McNally at one point who just we have performers. The hard thing is getting audiences who are less than geriatric. And that's what we need to cultivate, people who are willing to listen and participate in some way. And because of all the awareness that we have had uh, put on us from media from the last year, and rightfully so, I must say, uh, is ragtime culturally because of the association with its history in Blacks, is it in danger of being canceled? And is there a way we can maybe skirt that and yeah this is a, a tough issue but we're going to need to approach it over the next couple of years and carol i know you have something to say on that i from the images i think we should launch a campaign to have both black and white artists reinterpret the images all of those old covers of ragtime and um and of course, we would um, set up a prize, you know, start a promotion to get those images out there and to get new artists to reinterpret them, how especially blacks, but half black, half white. And let's see the best we can do, how people can interpret those works now. Also, I think we should launch for red time. We should, um, Launch include um, get it into popular a campaign to get it into popular music. Now um, we should encourage artists to use ragtime. We should have a competition of rappers who will sample rap ragtime music and put it in rap songs. And thirdly, in their new recordings. Thirdly, we should have a general competition of new ragtime music composed by those 18 years and younger. And so we should do this in, on a, in a consolidated way. Start a promotion, get ragtime on the lips of everyone in our communities, uh, in each organization, and in, a, in uh, all working together, all Joplin interests, all ragtime interest groups coming together and putting funds aside from different events, giving trophies, having the winners played on the radio, getting them in newspaper articles, getting them online, publicize them, and just generally getting that. A renewal of the image, how would we see that today? You know, the right. artists get, you know, and explain why with a tag on what, what we feel happened at that time and how we can ameliorate that. And reassociate the term with the music and not with the culture from which it came. Absolutely. All right, John. Bring it up to today image and the music right so so kind of ex extending off the carol suggestion of derivative works not just in rap music but 
anything that can make uh, ragtime more pervasively rhythmically interesting. And of course, I'm more focused on the left hand part. If, if the left hand part can have the same interesting syncopation that the right hand parts characteristically have, and if it, that's playable, maybe it'll take two pianists to do it. But something that'll they'll they'll just rhythmically make it more exciting and less fatiguing after listening to that umpa pulse for a long time. Um, and also just uh, maybe a, a biopic about Joplin of better quality than the one that was made back in the 70s, something with a high, high budget. I agree. Um, there's was just fun. so much potential there. I mean, that's there. Someone has to do a biopic. I just, you know, Spielberg, maybe, who knows, but has to be done. And that that's my thoughts. OK, Baron. I think it's important that we have a shared vision of the ideal that we're pursuing. I, the ideal that I wish to pursue is one of the celebration of artistic ec excellence in whatever form, it, with whatever <clears throat> origin it has, what, regardless of the, the skin tone and race and whatever of the creator. Um, and if that's, if, so let's just assume that's the vision since I'm the, I'm the one talking, then that puts what happened a hundred years ago and so forth into context not just of well is it bad or good then it's more okay well what should we do about it now how can we get towards this ideal future of appreciating great art regardless of where it came from and i um i differ a little bit from i like a lot of what carol proposed about um about have offering remixes and so forth i would prefer not to have any sort of quota on what the races are of the people who create it because right. i think that that continues the problem that we've had uh it also it also puts me in a bind because i'm both i'm my mother's white and my dad's black so what do you i know there's yeah. there, i mean yeah. th there's um that that's 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 extra baggage that I bring into these discussions anyway because I think well all, all, the, all the terms all the terms that we use are shorthand for people for actual people and I am a combination of both of the terms so that put so we have to deal with those categorical uh, those those difficulties um, one one tactic that I think would be extremely helpful is in these competitions. Um, whatever may, may come about with the competitions that already exist. And this will require some courage on the, on the, on the host of these competitions and everybody involved is to, is to offer whatever is produced in the, into the public domain. Because if that's done, then it create, and I've done this with my own compositions over the, over the last, over this year that I've just published, I've, I've published them without copyright in the public domain. And uh, I did not expect the outpouring of, of gratitude and the desire to work with me that came just out of that gesture. I've, there's, there are dance companies who are, uh, who are, so I hear looking into choreographing dances to my music, um, partially just because they don't have to pay through the nose for that. So if if these compositions were pub published in the public domain, then producers, rappers know that they don't have to ask permission. They're not going to get hit with any sort of copyright strike. And that will give everyone permission to give ad give ragtime free uh, advertising, essentially. And so that's one tactic that I think would go over very well, but it requires a, a long term a mindset uh, over the short term gain. I I want to add here and and Baron I I think what you said just now was wonderful. I I really first of all think that the whole world of copyright well I don't even want to open that that can of worms but <laughs> I mean it's it's been such a stifling issue that is only relevant to the past 100 years. Uh, and and prior to that, music was music composition was truly approached differently. Um, I wanted to just throw out a couple of ideas. First of all, great music from any era in any style does not require historical context. So the best of ragtime is just great music. It doesn't matter that it was written in 1903. It, it matters that it's a great piece of music. 
so so for ragtime to be accessible, we don't require the historical context. Um, while there's a lot of baggage to this issue, I don't think that uh, the sheet music covers to most people are really an object of familiarity at all. Uh, I think most people today that know the sound of the entertainer do not know what the sheet music cover to the entertainer looks like. Um, if we are going to approach teaching the historical context of ragtime, though, I think it's important for the sheet mu for, for the sheet music covers to be there. It's part of the story. It's not the happy part of the story necessarily, but it's part of the story. And I, I am very much in favor of the notion that knowledge is power here. Um, if, if we sweep something under the rug just because it's unsightly, that does not solve the problem. Um, I, I think it's much more important that if we are going to be talking about historical precedent, and how we got to where we are today, we're going to have to be able and willing and comfortable opening the door and discussing what has come before. Okay, fair enough. And then to Velvet, who again is the layperson, but you spend as much time or more as anybody selling this, uh, the notion, the joy of ragtime to people, uh, what is our future? Um, I think that future is always in education. And I agree with some of the uh, ideas that Carol threw out. I think those are all wonderful ways to create more of an interest in ragtime and to put it out there in the forefront. Um, I'm also a little leery of sort of pushing one genre over another because I think that might stifle uh, natural progression. Um, if we're, if we're sort of advertising uh, ragtime and we're getting people to be more um, in, uh, apt to work on ragtime, are we missing out on a future genre that may be in the works? Um, I do think that uh, the cover art is inconsequential to a lot of people. Um, I would say that I probably don't know of any visitors who have been interested in Joplin other than music teachers uh, that would be familiar with the images um, and their uh, negativity. That being said, I do think that People who have a love of ragtime, a love of Joplin, need to be prepared with an answer in case it does become an issue because sensitivity to race issues has become such a hot topic these days. I think you, know, you can give uh, the music more exposure just by dealing with that problem. It brings it into the light and we can get contemporary participants uh, to work on that and to bring ragtime as a whole to the public forefront. Well, this is going to be a continuing a small part of it. This will be a continuing conversation going into the future. I think we'll do more in 2022 when we are back together in Sedalia. This whole thing has exceeded my expectations by far, and hopefully everybody here. And your input has been valuable, and all your contributions will make sure that. There are ways for people to find out more about you all uh, linked on the site. And hopefully this will be a permanent record for everyone to see and to grow upon. So I wanna thank- I will uh, say one of... thing, Bill, yes, if, if I may, I'd like to invite everyone to Texarkana and hear Scott Joplin's music played on the only Tesla music choral in America in the museum, in our uh, Texarkana Museum. I'll be there. Okay. Okay. I, I want all the public to, to come. So thank you to Carol Collins uh, Miller. We got uh, Velvet John Tennyson, Baron Ryan, Bill McNally, and myself, Bill Edwards. And we say adieu and hope to see you 
in Sedalia soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.